Uh, hey guys, I'm joined here with uh, Andy Nowicki. Uh, he's been the author of, of set, uh, numerous different novels. And Andy, it's nice having you on. So you've been on VOR before to discuss some of your novels. Uh, yes, well, first of all, thank you for having me. It's an honor uh, to be here. Um, and yes, I, I've been on before. I was on most recently with Matt Parrott last year. Uh, I believe it was maybe it was in the summer uh, or May or June, something like that, to discuss uh, uh, my book, um, The Columbine Pilgrim. Uh, and yeah, and I, I was also on uh, Tom Sunick's show also to discuss The Columbine Pilgrim. So I've been on before uh, mainly to promote the Columbine Pilgrim, and of course my new book is called Under the Nile, uh, Nile spelled N-I-H-I-L, which is also uh, has also been published uh, by Countercurrents Press, the same uh, company, Greg Johnson's uh, publishing company, the same uh, ones who, who came out with um, with the Columbine Pilgrim. So I'm happy to be here to plug that book with you tonight, and also talk about some other things. So I want to. We're going to focus on your your recent book, but could you just please go over briefly your about what your past books, two books are the column. Well, you have several of them, but the more recent ones, the well, they're considering suicide, Columbine Pilgrim, and the Doctor and the Heretic. Just please give kind of a brief overview what those are, and you can refer the audience to the past interviews, which go into more depth. Okay. Uh, well, sure. I'll, I'll just a brief inventory of my what I've published so far in the last few years. Um, in 2009, I, I published my first novel with Nine Banded Books. Uh, that that uh, was a title called Considering Suicide. And uh, then last year, 2011, I published my second novel. Oh, could uh, you please tell tell us briefly what it was about? Oh, okay. I'm sorry. Considering suicide is, it's kind of hard to describe. It's, it's, it's a meditation on the question of whether or not life is worth living, uh, particularly in uh, our postmodern age where, uh, uh, and this is a theme of a lot of what I write, whether it's uh, novels or, or the articles that I've written for Alternative Right and uh, The Last Ditch and other places. But, uh, just how in our in our current zeitgeist the uh, evaporation, if you will, of of, uh, of spiritual substance uh, and the the void that is left behind because of it. And my book, considering suicide, was about uh, the, the the it was divided into two parts. The first part is a uh, is a diary purported purportedly a diary of a man uh, considering uh, killing himself. And uh, what he's going through, the things he's wrestling with, and so that's uh, like a, a first-person fiction account. That's kind of that's I would say heavily influenced by Kierkegaard. Uh, and what reasons was he considering suicide for? Well, I think that what it, what it boils down to uh, for him and for a lot of my characters is uh, a crisis of faith. You know, I think man is a uh, is the type of animal, you know, man doesn't live by bread alone. Uh, we need something more to sustain us. And this is a, a character who is simply, uh, in many ways, I think a, a lot of the, the uh, listeners of the show could, could probably relate uh, as being, uh, like me, dissidents from the zeitgeist, you know, people who, uh, who object to the smelly little orthodoxies of our time, uh, and the, hypo the, the nauseating hypocrisy of a time that claims to be so open-minded and yet, uh, you know, uh, grinds down on, on anyone with a dissident uh, point of view, uh, you know, and, and, and all of that in the, in the midst of this great spiritual void. And, uh, you know, just also the, the, the basic existential issues, which have always been with us, um, you know, before modernity, at any time that, that man is has been uh, alive, because life is, is hard. Um, life is difficult. So this is a guy who's wrestling with some big questions. And so that's the first part of the book, called Diary of a Suicide. The second part is uh, called Is Life Worth Living? 
This is part so he two. does he does kill himself in the book? Well, it's uh, it's sort of left ambiguous, and I don't want to <laughs> I don't want to give it away, so to speak. Okay, but um, it, it's uh, it's certainly something that uh, I think different readers could take different things uh, from the the ending of part one. Uh, and part two is a uh, more or less a treatise, uh, a nonfiction treatise uh, about the the current state of things, uh, uh, for lack of a better way of putting it. Uh, in the postmodern West, in, uh, in this uh, decadent, uh, degraded age in which we, we live. Um, in the midst of it all, uh, you know, again, this crisis of faith uh, and the question, uh, is life worth living? And the, and the conclusion that we, come, that we come to at the end of that story, or, or that, uh, that segment of the book, um, is uh, that we have to... Uh, at least have faith in faith um, that, you know, even if uh, we find ourselves in an agnostic state, ultimately, where, where we're really struggling, uh, wanting to believe, but not being granted the, the ability to believe for one reason or another, uh, or, um, you know, not disbelieving, but not believing either, that we kind of have to hedge our bets a little bit and have faith in faith. So yeah, so that's uh, like I said, it's a it's a an odd little book, uh, but I'm happy with how it's sold, uh, and I think it's found a a kind of niche audience with um, with nine banded books and uh, an excellent uh, company, by the way, lesser known but uh, a company out of West Virginia run by Chip Smith. So that was my first book, uh, considering suicide, and. And last year, 2011, I uh, published a book that I'm probably most excited about having written, uh, and that is a book called The Columbine Pilgrim, uh, which is uh, I've, I've dis- discussed extensively with Sunik and, and with Matt Parrott, uh, and I've talked about it with uh, Richard Spencer on Alt-Right Radio and on um, The Political Cesspool. Um, and... For uh, those of your listeners who, who are unfamiliar with the Columbine Pilgrim or who have heard of it but may, may not have uh, read it yet, uh, it is a nasty little revenge fantasy, and it centers around a, uh, the, the kind of scenario that we've, we've uh, read and seen a lot of times, the kind of revenge of the nerd uh, uh, scenario about somebody who, who gets revenge for, uh, for all of the terrible things that were done to him uh, <clears throat> when he was an, uh, uh, an awkward adolescent uh, struggling through high school. So in some ways it's a very familiar story, but uh, I think it goes a little bit further and, ta- and takes things into slightly more uncomfortable territory and um, somewhat horrific uh, territory. Um, it's a very... So, so un- who is the protagonist, and who is he seeking vengeance against? Well, the main character is a man named Tony Meander, and he is 33 years old, uh, as the story begins, and uh, he's making a pilgrimage uh, to Columbine High School in in uh, uh, Littleton, Colorado, the the infamous uh, site of the the notorious massacre that took place in 1999. So he, he's, he, he's making a pilgrimage, and we're hearing uh, him talk, talk about what he's seeing and what he's experiencing, and he goes on this bizarre little tour from uh, other Colum- with other Columbine enthusiasts, and um, he, he flashes back and remembers certain uh, uh, things from his past, uh, uh, ways that he was... Uh, just humiliated and, and picked on and dragged through the dirt. Uh, and we get the feeling he's, he's plotting something, thinking about doing something along the lines of what was done at Columbine. Some, he's plotting some terrible event or other. And then uh, the second part of the book uh, is told in the third-person point of view, and we find out what he did uh, after initially making this this pilgrimage. And again, as with uh, considering suicide, I don't necessarily want to give everything away, but I will say it's a nasty little book. If you like 
incredibly violent revenge stories. Uh, this this is uh, is your kind of book. If if that's not so much your thing, it's probably not the book for you. Um, so, but who are the who is he seeking revenge against? People who bullied him in the past, basically. Yeah. Um, okay, it, mm-hmm. I get it. Yeah, and uh, I think one of the ways in which this story takes things in a slightly different direction and and makes things a bit more uncomfortable for the reader is, as I was saying, uh, this man is 33. Uh, so it's been 15 years since he graduated from high school. Uh, and, and most of the time, you know, you kind of hope that somebody who got to that age would be able to slough off uh, his past and just, you know, see it for what it was, for, you know, the ridiculousness that it was. And, you know, it was just a part of youth and, and to move on. Uh, I think there was a slasher film that was like that. Forget yes, the name well, of it. There was, there, there have been, um, there, there uh, was I one. I think it was a Valentine. There's a movie called Valentine. It was a slasher film sim- on a similar note. Really? Okay, I, I, I'm, not, I'm not familiar with that one. I do remember uh, one for, uh, called The Final uh, that was uh, where uh, it, it was... It, it takes things in a somewhat thematically similar direction. And of course, there's just about every single movie about high school uh, is something like, you know, there, there's something of this whole, you know, feeling unpopular, feeling picked on. And the whole bullying thing is, is so ubiquitous today. And, every, you know, everybody talks about the, the problem of the quote unquote problem of bullying. And of course, you know, bullying is a bad thing, of course, is naturally a bad thing. But it's become a very trendy issue today and uh, somewhat we get the impression from some people it's just a, a means of pushing it, pushing through some kind of uh, social agenda. And, you know, I wanted to, with writing the Columbine Pilgrim, I wanted to, to I, I always try to write more, uh, I hope, I mean, it's kind of a pretentious maybe uh, idea, but I kind of want to write for the ages. You know, I, I don't want it to be current. Uh, I don't want it to just be something that's trendy and uh, reflects current trends, but 10 years from now or 20 years from now will just seem like a relic of the past. You know, I, I try to deal with things that are more eternal uh, or uh, things that, issues that that we see repeating over and over again that are just simply a part of the human condition. Uh, and so I think that's what I that's what I tried to do with the Columbine Pilgrim. I wanted to take this familiar story uh, and, so, and in some ways take it into uh, very uh, foreign and terrifying uh, territory where you are kind of rooting for this guy, but at the same time you're, you're also somewhat horrified by his actions. Um, that's an interesting position to put the reader in. Uh, where you're not. Do you have pr- sure. thought about presenting it to a, a studio to make it into a film? I think it would make a good. It sounds like it make a good movie. Yeah, that that has that has occurred to me. I mean, you never know. I'm trying to talk it up, and again, as with um, as with considering suicide, I think it's found somewhat of a niche, and and uh, uh, you know, it's it's. Uh, I, I've gotten some a lot of good comments from people. Uh, who have read it? It's not. I guess, like we were saying before, it's not a book. One of my, my last guests, uh, Marilyn Miller, he has a, owns a, move, uh, fi- a film studio. He makes movies, so maybe I'll put you in touch with okay. him. <laughs> All right, this could be the start of something big. Who knows? Yeah. <laughs> and then before we move on to your recent one, can you just comment briefly on what was the Doctor and the Heretic about? The Doctor and the Heretic and other stories is a, is a collection of three short stories. Uh, if the Columbine Pilgrim is is uh, maybe the most uh, the most guy oriented thing that I've written, the Doctor and the Heretic is my effort at uh, at uh, chick lit. Uh, it's a, a romance story, and uh, it's it's kind of an edgy romance uh, uh, because it, it's between a uh, a beautiful forty seven year old widow uh, psychotherapist and her much younger very troubled uh, 24-year-old uh, patient. And, again, it, it kind of pushes boundaries just like uh, in, in similar ways that to uh, how uh, the Columbine Pilgrim does. But take, taking things in a 
in a rather different direction, also still meditating on the same kind of concepts, the difficulty of having faith in a faithless world. And I'm also very proud of having written uh, that that uh, um, story. It's it's sort of a, a short. It's, it's sort of a long short story, and there are two other stories that are included in the collection uh, as well. One of which is also another Columbine themed uh, story uh, called Tears of the Damned. Uh, as you can probably tell by now, Columbine is a kind of fascination uh, for me. Um, uh, and the other, you know, one- I actually I've met a survivor of Columbine. At some political events, I forget his name. I think mm-hmm. it's something Costanaldo, but he. Yeah. I met him at a end the Fed event and like some kind of event about Gaza. But he yeah. was running for Congress for the Peace and Freedom Party. Yes, Richard Richard Castaldo. Yeah, you've uh, yeah, that's right, Castaldo. You've met him. I I have I, I've I've uh, uh, corresponded with him a little. He's one of my Facebook friends and seems like a great guy. Um, but yes, he was. Uh, he was maimed in the the, the, the Columbine tragedy. Uh, was shot, I believe, nine times, and of course survived, but uh, uh, has been uh, paralyzed, I think, from the from the waist down uh, ever since then. Um, but yes, yeah, so so um, so I've got another Columbine themed story uh, in uh, the Doctor and the Heretic, and then also another story called Autobiography of a Violent Soul. These these are the three stories that comprise. Uh, the Doctor and the Heretic, and um, that brings us uh, to the present, where uh, uh, the latest uh, novel that I've published uh, is um, called Under the Nile. And as I was saying before, it's uh, <laughs> the title might might trip some people up. Uh, it's it's pronounced uh, it's it's uh, in, in the uh, in the story. Uh, Nile is uh, spelled N-I-H-I-L, which is, I guess, the correct pronunciation is Neil or Nihil or something like that. Uh, and uh, it, it's a reference to a particular substance uh, in the story um, that's called this, but pronounced the same as Nile. It's like so, the, what is this was, was substance? Um, well, uh, under the Nile is a story that, as I said, it's another um, just a set the table a little bit or give some context. Uh, Under the Nile is uh, also published by Countercurrents, who who, uh, published my previous novel, The Columbine Pilgrim. And it's a, in many ways, uh, thematically similar to uh, what The Columbine Pilgrim was. deals with many of the same issues. The the main character is uh, a first-person narrator who is uh, profoundly alienated, depressed, uh, 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 feels out of place in the modern world, wants to have a greater faith, uh, but, but can't summon it up, uh, and also feels very marginalized and slighted and put down. Uh, and in the first part of the, of the novel, after an unsuccessful attempt at um, uh, going through seminary school, because originally he wants to become a priest, um, but that that uh, fails, uh, and he ends up leaving seminary and having a nervous breakdown. And the, then the story takes a takes a certain uh, twist uh, around the middle because after he's uh, recovering uh, in the hospital, he uh, the the main character is visited by this mysterious uh, figure uh, who claims to be. Uh, some sort of uh, a consultant for a private firm that that works with the government in one capacity or another. Um, and so this guy comes to him. He's a very uh, a slick, uh, smooth talking kind of guy. And our our hero or our, our anti hero really kind of despises him, but is fascinated by him at the same time. Anyway. This um, this agent, whoever he is, proposes to the the narrator that he become basically a guinea pig. That there's this substance that 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 uh, uh, is that is being developed. This this uh, pill called Nile N I H I L, and it's something that if you take it, 
uh, the, the, or the, the uh, purpose of it is to take away all of one's inhibitions um, so that one has no fear, including uh, uh, fear of death. And the idea is that the government eventually wants to be able to use this drug uh, in the war on terror, the so-called war on terror, to give to soldiers who are uh, in uh, uh, certain operations so that they can fight, they, they can really match these uh, Muslim jihadists. I think, you know, I think there is a drug, I forget what it's called, but it does something like that. Oh yeah, I, I mean, I'm sure. Where it gets rid of, I think. It, well, I don't know if it get, I think it does get rid of fear. I've talked. I've spoken to someone who's taken it. There is uh, oh. antipsychotic drug of a that it does have a similarity to that. Yeah, I'm. I'm sure that there, are all kinds of. I mean, I, I, I don't know anything. Obviously, I'm not. I'm not in the loop on these matters. But it would surprise me if there wasn't, um, you know, some experimentation along those lines. And, of course, the, the whole idea in the book, again, addressing the issue of faith. Here in the Western world, uh, we tend not to, uh, you know, we were, we were once, a, uh, the West was once Christian and, and, uh, and had, a, had a strong uh, belief in a transcendent uh, reality, in a, in a, you know, in a, a God, uh, and in a, uh, in eternal principles of right and wrong. <clears throat> but we don't really have that anymore. In the West, it's more of a therapeutic uh, paradigm these days. And, uh, the, and, and we're up against, uh, in, in the so-called war on terror, uh, we're up against these, these people uh, who, you know, these fanatics who, who believe very strongly in their faith and are not afraid to die for it and not afraid to kill or die uh, because uh, they think they're, what they're doing is in, you know, is uh, God's will, and that they'll be, uh, uh, they'll be rewarded for it in the next life. And, you know, so so, how do you counteract that? I guess is is the big one of the big issues that's addressed in the story. And I mean, they, yeah, you got to say, I mean, what, whether they're they may be a, a enemy, but you, it does say something that they believe in something so strong that they're willing to die, die for it. Our societies become kind of so shallow and decadent yeah. that no one really believes in anything. Yes, precisely, and 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 so that that uh, brings up this situation in which, uh, in the world of this of the book under the Nile, uh, you know they're trying to artificially create this state of mind in, in people where you, where it's the the benefits of of faith, uh, well with while keeping the luxuries of faithlessness. Uh, is how uh, one character puts it in the story. Um, so he starts taking this drug, um, and then uh, it, of course, uh, at first he doesn't, he can't tell much of a difference, and then eventually uh, uh, he, we do start to see some personality changes in him, uh, and he goes on all kinds of. Uh, Shall we say adventures? Uh, uh, he, he's he's uh, he becomes this. Um, uh, he uh, well, uh, you know, as as I was saying before, he loses his inhibitions, uh, and he he just starts uh, doing thing doing whatever he feels like doing uh, because nothing really matters, um, uh, and it's a kind of uh, again a simultaneously liberating and and uh and kind of amusing uh, uh state to be in while also somewhat frightening um because again if there's no if, the, if nothing matters if there's no right and wrong if you've got this very nihilistic point of view uh on things then there's really nothing that you're not capable of um and he becomes a man by the time the story the story is over he, he becomes uh, a man who's capable of uh, practically anything, um, and I, again, I don't want to give away the ending, uh, but uh, things go in a different direction than than uh, than he would have expected, and in, in a different direction than uh, his handler, this uh, this somewhat smug and arrogant uh, uh, agent guy, uh, thinks that things are going to go as well. 
Um, uh, hold on a, a second, please. Uh, all right. It's time for a break now. Uh, please stay with us. Uh, welcome back. I'm joined here with uh, author Andy Nowicki. So uh, p- we were discussing your book, Under the Nile. Please mm-hmm. continue. Please continue. Okay. And again, it's Under the Nile or Under the Neil, spelled uh, N-I-H-I-L. Uh, it's available from Countercurrents. It's countercurrents.com. Oh, and you can find it on Amazon and at barnesandnoble.com. And, is it uh, a better? It's a better deal on countercurrents. You would rec- recommend yeah, that? Yeah, oh, sure, sure. Yeah, I would recommend getting it through the publisher. It's, uh, uh, I'm sure Greg would would prefer me to say that as well. Um, and I and you know I I am profoundly grateful to Greg Johnson and uh, the the folks at Countercurrents for giving for uh, letting me publish the second novel with them. It's been something that's uh, that's been uh, very a very enjoyable experience as a writer, and, and uh, I feel very lucky uh, for it. So yes, uh, it's available now. It was it was just released, uh, I believe, maybe it was, it was maybe a Christmas release. Um, you know, it's a fine Christmas novel. Um, I mean that ironically. Well, maybe if you've got a you know certain dark Christmas sensibility, it is. So yeah, it's uh, it's. It's out there. It's available, uh, and it's kind of uh, what uh, I, 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 when we were talking before, I, I referred to it as a thematic sequel to the Columbine Pilgrim, uh, my earlier uh, novel published through Countercurrents. And I would say, if the if the Columbine Pilgrim is a kind of uh, psychological horror story, uh, this, in some ways, uh, it's also a psychological thriller. But uh, it, this this has certain science fiction elements uh, to it. Um, it's not through and through pure science fiction, uh, but it deals with certain in, in with certain speculative possibilities uh, regarding uh, drugs and, and drug manufacturing and the, the notion of taking a drug to create a certain type of of perfect soldier. Um, which, as I was saying before, I, you know, I'm, I'm sure there's experimentation along those lines. Even though I have no, I have no affiliation with the military-industrial complex myself, so I can't speak firsthand uh, about any of it. But it would surprise me if there weren't uh, something along those lines. And also, um, just just one last thing I'll say about uh, "Under the Nile," spelled N-I-H-I-L, uh, is part of what what uh, made me interested in this subject matter is, um, interestingly enough, the the the, uh, the manufacture of antidepressants. Um, it's of course a big, you know, people are diagnosed as depressive today uh, in droves, and antidepressants are prescribed all the time. Or uh, sort of like the soma in Brave New World. Exactly. Yes, it is. And that's that's the paradigm. That's that's where we're headed. Uh, you know, in some ways, it's uh, we're we're going down the, the path that Aldous Huxley set forth in in Brave New World, where you know life is just about comfort and pleasure and the avoidance of pain, rather than you know the pursuit of uh, transcendent uh, meaning. So you see that more than the 1984 scenario where people are kept in line with more by fear and and pain, which is good. Yeah, I, I, I actually I do. I, I think Huxley was more prophetic than Orwell, in my personal opinion, at least from what I have seen and experienced. Of course, you know there are certain Orwellian elements, uh, uh, political correctness uh, it being foremost among them in, in the West. Uh, you know, there is this, you know, this, um, there are these forces that want to shut you up if you're a dissident and take away your, uh, you know, uh, say you don't have any right to freedom of speech uh, unless you agree with us. Um, you know, of course, that's, there's that strain, there's that element out there as well. But I would say a more overarching uh, element in our culture today is 
is more of the brave new world, the uh, uh, aspect of things, the this um, making happiness, uh, quote unquote, you know, the uh, the uh, the end of of everything, um, the the purpose of everything, that just this therapeutic uh, kind of perspective on on life, that that life is just about again trying to be comfortable, trying to have have fun and uh, pursue pleasure uh, within certain, you know, therapeutic limits and to avoid pain. And yeah, there's, there's there certain, I mean, from my narrow point of view, uh, of course, you know, I've, I've had some run-ins with the, with the, uh, the uh, political correct, the, the, the awful machine of political correctness, but nothing that huge uh, in my case so far. Uh, for me, I would say, you know, I would put me down for for uh, saying we're much more uh, brave new world eyes than 1984 eyes. Um, but again, that's just my subjective experience. I'm sure others would have uh, have a very different story to tell. Yeah, especially if you look at things like torture that have, that have gone on. I think it's kind of both both tactics are used. But mm-hmm. for the average person, this is like for the average person, they're more being kept in this kind of, like they say, ignorance is yeah. bliss. In the matrix. To, yeah, to, to exactly. Use that overused uh, uh, expression. Yeah, that uh, I would say so. At least, again, from my from my limited perspective. But um, but there's no reason why they can't. That, that those two uh, seemingly disparate elements can't. Uh, work in tandem also um, we're persuaded to be docile and submissive and and not to not to question things um, and I always think of that really cheesy but somehow enduring movie they live which I imagine you've seen yeah Roddy Piper uh, <laughs> and uh, it, it, yeah we're so so we're uh, on the one hand, Given the message that, uh, or, or it's put out to us that we have to consume and, uh, you know, do what we can to enjoy things and not question things too much, not, you know, not struggle, not suffer. That's the brave new world side of things. But on the other hand, there's this vicious kind of force out there as well among the powers that be, uh, the where if you cause too much trouble if you step out of line in one way or another or say something that that threatens the system, for lack of a better word, uh, bad things can happen to you. Now, it's it's less likely in the United States or, or in the Western world in general that you're going to be arrested and tortured, but you, uh, you might lose your job, uh, you might get shunned uh, by, uh, by everybody who you thought was your friend, and you might just become an uh, an unperson, um, to use that Orwellian kind of language. Uh, so, so yeah, the, uh, it's the you know the Orwell and the Huxley. Uh, I think they're both happening today. Yeah, de- definitely. So your article, your most recent article for the alt right is p- called "Men, Masturbation, and Monogamy." And you start off by talking about the sexual revolution of the 1960s and 70s, per, which permeated sort of this catastrophical, delib- deliberating impact on nearly all aspects of modern life. And you talk mm-hmm. about sort of these, t- these toddy pop songs like the Black Eyed Peas, My Humps, mm-hmm. or Lady Gaga's Disco Sticks that, that play in the radio nonstop. Mm-hmm. Yes, um, that the 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 article again, uh, you, uh, just to repeat, is called "Men, Masturbation, and Monogamy," and I've gotten a lot of good feedback uh, on it. Um, and uh, you, uh, this was the article that that captured your attention, uh, that made you interested in having me on as a guest. So, uh, if I could turn it <laughs> over to you for a second, maybe can you uh, tell me what you? Uh, enjoyed about the article or found interesting about it? Well, it just kind of, let, let me, hold on a second, let me scroll, 
scroll down. Oh, it's not letting me. It's not letting me view the whole article. Yeah, sure. Where it says read more, but just sums up. I mean, it does. It's a catchy title for starters. Mm -hmm. Yes, good alliteration there. And kind of the the writing, like I'll give you an example, is you talk about how we're su subsumed in this wretched, maladorious ejaculate ooze. Like it's that kind of very vivid writing. The yes. very vivid. <laughs> yes. Um, well, uh, yeah. I mean, I'm, I was just curious because uh, just just for our listeners, uh, the. Uh, the first I, I heard from you, uh, I was I was on Facebook, and then I, I got a, a message from you saying you wanted to be on your show to, to talk about my latest alt right article, and I was <laughs> I was thrilled. Of course, it's always it's always great uh, you know to get a response like that. But but that, it also made me curious to know uh, what was your what uh, uh, what really struck you about that article? And, and I, you know, I've, I, like I said, I've gotten some comments from other people. I knew I was kind of going out on a limb, uh, with, uh, a lot of what that article discusses. Um, what, what motivated it was, uh, and again, I, I encourage people to go to alternative uh, and look it up. Um, or you can just Google it, men, masturbation, and monogamy. Um, and, uh, what motivated it was I was listening to, uh, you know, I'm a, I'm a Catholic, uh, and I was listening to Catholic radio, uh, one day and there was, uh, this show, uh, that was on that where the host was talking just about in, in what seemed to me very lurid terms about the, uh, the pornography epidemic, let's say, and how in the internet age, the way he was talking about it, just just about every every man out there is addicted uh, to porn, or, or very few aren't. And so, young women who are dating, Catholic women who are dating, uh, who think they're dating the perfect, uh, you know, moral Catholic guy, uh, well, uh, he might just be addicted to internet porn and and just uh, you know a slave to his lusts. Uh, and you need to find out about this early, or else it's gonna you know, cause you a lot of heartbreak. And it just seemed to me like it was so overblown. Um, and it's, it, you know, in the context of this very, uh, you know, the, the lines you were reading a few minutes ago, this, this, uh, this very, um, uh, destructive sexual revolution, you know, everything that's, that's happened since the, the sixties and seventies, since the, the, uh, that wretched, baby boomer uh, generation uh, seized the reins and uh, you know started uh, changing things in ways that they thought were were good I, I'm generalizing here I'm sure there, there are plenty of uh, baby boomers who aren't so bad but uh, f from that era you know we got this this sexual revolution and now we're left with this you know our, our culture is in tatters you know um, uh, the institution of the family is is uh, uh, has been uh, greatly um, uh, reduced. Uh, you know, marriage, divorce it may not be at an all-time high, but it's it's still uh, you know something uh, somewhere around fifty percent or so. And, and cohabitation and other uh, other kinds of uh, things are happening. Uh, you know, of course, premarital sex is almost uh, is almost a given that 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 that's going to take place. Uh, you know, we don't. We don't want to tell teenagers to wait. You know, that's just considered foolish uh, in our day and age. And so, um, really, there's there's been so much uh, uh, a wearing away uh, of... Uh, there, there's been so much destructiveness out, that's come out of the baby boomer sexual... baby boomer-led sexual revolution uh, that, in my mind, it's even permeated to... The people on the other side. Now you've got you know, Catholics like the, the ones that I was re referencing in my in my article, who uh, again see sex everywhere, and it, it's all, it almost inspires this kind of prurient uh, um, drive to uh, I don't know to, to see uh, 
uh, every every man as a as a sex addict uh, and to break him down to humiliate him to drag him into therapy uh, and, and again I'm exaggerating it a little bit I'm sure the intention is not you know on the part of this this particular writer and others it, you know is not as nefarious as I'm making it sound but the, the outcome seems to be somewhat along those lines um, and then you, you talk about the Dork, Dorkin style feminist isn't Andrea Dorkin the one who said that all sex is rape yes that's right um, yeah, there's there's this uh, like I said this this strange alliance between some of the more fundamentalist uh, religious uh, people, and I'm again I'm friendly to with religion, and I'm a, a conservative, uh, and I and I believe in uh, you know I, I believe in um, sexual morality, traditional sexual morality, but there is this uh, strange kind of uh, uh, intersection between the uh, again the the kind of the religious fundamentalists who would say, uh, uh, you know, that that uh, if you ever do anything, uh, you know, if you uh, sneak a peek at a at a centerfold in Playboy, let's say, or uh, or or, uh, or at a sexy YouTube video, or, or I don't know, whatever, um, that this means you have a problem and you need to get help, and and it it, it becomes this this. Uh, Overblown kind of kind of thing, um, and uh, uh, you know. Whereas the, the fact is, it's part of our biology. You know, and I make that point in the article as well. Uh, it's part of how we were created. For whatever reason, as men, um, um, we have these particular drives. Okay, and uh, and and I, I, the point I make in the article also is in the pre-sexual revolution days. If somebody transgressed in one way or another, it would be more normal for them to just uh, go see their priest, confess their sin, and and then have it be done with. But in our day, it's somehow it's like everything becomes psychotherapeuticized, if that's a word. Um, it, it it you know becomes something where, that you have to bring to your to your therapist, and you have to get into uh, these um, uh, these these kinds of uh, deep dark uh, uh, recesses of of, uh, of the human psyche, uh, and and uh, you know, this, there's this, somehow this this foregoing conviction that you must be a sex addict, uh, and that you know again pornography is is something that's just super addictive, and if you ever see anything, if you ever transgress in any way, that again it's it's like it all gets blown out of proportion, and that's I think the the point I'm trying to make in that article is so your way you're saying is not as addictive as people say it is yeah i well i um yeah i mean i don't think that i think that most most men uh you know and i'm not excusing it either i'm not saying eh, it's harmless to to uh to um uh to stray uh sexually uh in one way or another but it, it's there. There is such a thing as hi, as a hierarchy of sin, and I think that's something that uh, you know is also a, a result of our of our age uh, that's permeated into mostly the fundamentalist Protestant kind of ethos, but also a little bit into some of the the more Protestantized Catholic. Uh, but doesn't the hierarchy of sin is sort of I think it's sort of isn't that kind of a Catholic thing because the Bible kind of says that the wage of all sin is mm -hmm. is death. I think the Catholic Church kind of made more, came up more with the hierarchy. Well, yeah, I mean, I, I think that, yeah, and, and it's not to say that sin is, that some sins are okay and others are, are, are not. Obviously, sin by itself, by definition, sin is something that you shouldn't be doing. Um so, so yeah, I, so I, I'm, I'm treading, I, 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 it's like I'm kind of walking a line in this article. I'm treading carefully because I don't want to say, uh, you know, that, that it's, that it's perfectly fine to, uh, uh, to watch internet porn, uh, and then do what comes naturally when watches, inter when one watches internet <laughs> porn. Uh, but at the same time, I'm not, you know, I don't, uh, I, I just think it's it's gotten so blown out of proportion, and and it's kind of un, there's something unseemly about it that is very much in lockstep with 
the culture, ironically, because these are people who are trying to turn back the culture and who I think are, are well-meaning. Um, and again, I cite one of these, uh, one, an example of, of this in, in, in my article, but there are others, other examples of it as well. But it's like, um, it just all becomes a reflection of this, um, this very prurient, sex crazed, uh, culture that's, you know, so, um, so, so much prone to, uh, to wanting to, uh, make everything into a therapeutic issue as opposed to just acknowledging human weakness and, you know, you, you, Go to confession, or if you're not Catholic, you do something else to, to expiate your your sin, or you know to, to do your penance, or, or however however you see it, uh, and then you move on from there. Uh, and so you know it's not you know it, it's there there are I, I would I would say there are hierarchies. There are sins that are uh, there is a hierarchy of sin, uh, and if we're, you know, if we're going to say somebody who, uh, uh, I don't know, who committed some minor sin or some more minor sin is, is just as bad as, I don't know, somebody who's a, a mass murderer or who's, uh, 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 who, who cheats on his wife, that, that, that a, for, for example, a, a, uh, masturbator, a man, a married man who masturbates, there's some more alliteration, uh, uh, that a married man who masturbates is as bad as a uh, a married man who who cheats several times on his wife with you know in actual ways with with actual women. Um, I think that we should draw a distinction there, and I think it's reasonable to. Um, and I think there's this uh, again. The point of my article is that I think there's a tendency to among some of the uh, even the more conservatives in our culture today to to take things in an unfortunate prurient kind of direction where I think they there should be more I, I think the old way the what the wisdom of the the old days the uh, the pre Vatican II days the pre sexual revolution days is simply to you know to to acknowledge human weakness and move on like I was saying. Well, I think there is kind of a, on the issue of masturbation, there's kind of a split among, I think, Christian theologians and mm -hmm. clergy, whether it's a sin or not. Yeah, sure. Well, I mean, I, yeah, it's, and, and then in, in, uh, in Catholic theology, there's the, the difference between, uh, uh, mortal sins and venial sins. Um, and I, I don't think it's just in, in Catholicism, but in other perspectives, the, the, I mean, I think the whole notion that if you sin at all, uh, that this makes you as bad as, uh, uh, as, uh, as some, one of the great mass murderers of history, let's say, uh, that, uh, I think there's something misbegotten about that whole concept, that whole notion. And it seems like it's especially, uh, it especially gets applied to sex. Uh, in our age, because we are more, we're living in a very, uh, uh, uh in this, an age that's, that's just saturated in. Yeah, in and even, I mean, premarital sex is mm -hmm. the norm for most Christians now. Yes, I would say, unfortunately, yeah, I would say that's the case. So maybe they know it's a, I don't know if they, 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 I don't know if they consider it a sin, or they're at, maybe they, they think they can just kind of repent later. Yeah. Or they ignore it. I don't know. It's how people no, are, I, I guess. It's, 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 um, it's the way that I think that all, most people are just followers, honestly. And if the culture says this is okay, then they, they figure it's okay. And whereas in the 40s or 50s, the culture said this is not okay, uh, then they would think twice about doing it because uh, you know, I think that's the way it is with with the, 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 the average person. Um, I, I, it was really a pleasure having you on. Yes, it was good to, it was good to be here. It was, uh, it was an enjoyable conversation. Thank you for giving me a chance to promote my new book again, under the Nile spelled N I H I L by Andy Nowicki. 
uh, that's available now from Countercurrents, or you can find it on Amazon or BarnesandNoble.com. Uh, that's all we have for tonight, so take care, and we're back with you next time.